Today, I am talking to Ashley Gavin, comedian, actor, podcaster, co-creator of the web series, Gr Gay Girl, Straight Girl, and this is gonna, you gotta be the only comedian with this background. <laughs> was a sophomore engineer at a national security research lab at MIT before founding and being the curriculum director at Girls Who Code. How you wow, doing? you did a deep dive. I did, well. I did, Minor I did, correction, I didn't please. found Girls Who Code. I was the, I was their second hire. I just, the, the founder really doesn't like me anymore. I probably shouldn't oh. be saying any of this. No, it's totally fine, leave it in, fuck her. But <laughs> uh, great organization, we don't like her, but great organization. Um, I was the second hire, curriculum director, yeah. I can see why you don't want to, you want to correct that and not if she doesn't like you for whatever reason you start saying yeah i created that yeah no, i'm not i'm not running around taking credit <laughs> did girls who code come out before girl code um no it didn't it didn't girl were, code was around yeah what did were they doing like a play on the tv show girl code i don't I don't really know what the what the origin of the name was but i actually think it's a pretty solid name great name Great yeah. name. Now, before I ask you some of the questions that I had prepared, what happened with TikTok? I know you did oh, an episode yeah. on it, but what happened? But what 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 happened? What did you do something inflammatory? Yeah, kinda, well, it's debatable, right? Because TikTok, they have these incredible algorithms. It's truly very scary stuff on there, especially if you're like the victim of it. Like, if it's not happening to you, I doubt you'll notice. But basically. Okay, so there's a big thing about panda porn on my podcast. We're having gay sex. We talk a lot about panda porn. It comes what do you mean? All the time. Did what do you, you mean? Pan pandas don't have sex, so we made porn for them. They watch other pandas fuck. Ashley, first of all, this took a real turn I wasn't expecting. <laughs> um, no, I, ha I have absolutely 100% no idea what you're talking about. I didn't, okay. know, I didn't know pandas don't have sex. Who they, makes they, them for you? They're having a hard time getting pandas. I make, yes, I'm, in addition to being a comedian and a former software engineer, I'm an amateur animal porn director. Um, and so, I have no yeah. idea why they kicked me off that <laughs> social media site. Well, I kept <laughs> uploading my clips because I thought I need to get a new audience here. All these 13-year-olds need to see. I'm trying to help the pandas. Yeah. No, they, so basically they make this so that, this is so funny because pandas are an endangered species. Sure. They have trouble. This is not my expertise, but they have trouble mating. They, they have a very small mating window. They can't get them to have sex, especially in captivity. So they huh. started making porn in hopes that they would watch the other pandas fuck and think, oh man, I should do that. And uh, they make them watch porn. But the funniest part about this is ever since quarantine started happening and people stopped going to the zoos, the pandas started fucking. So we ah. went to all these lengths to get these pandas to fuck and all they really needed was for us to leave them the fuck alone. Which makes so much sense. Yeah. So, yes. so much sense. They're just not exhibitionists or whatever the word is. Exactly. Who was doing the porn? How are they like casting that? Like what, what was the deal? <laughs> How are they casting it? Well, they bring, there's a couch and they bring <laughs> in a bunch of pandas and they go, have you done this before? Um, but uh, yeah, I know. I have no idea how they cast it. I don't know who's doing it. Obviously scientists, but. Let's I, pray. Let's yeah. fucking pray at scientists and not some like collaboration with who knows, some yeah. sleazy porn people. But basically I uploaded a couple videos basically talking about this and um, they did not like that one bit. Mm. I was, it was going great. I was gaining like a thousand new followers every day. Woo! It was blowing up my podcast and then uh, they shut all of it down and now I'm like trying to rebuild, which is a bummer, but whatever. It'll be fine. They shut you down. They took like without warning. They didn't say, hey, you got one, one more pan they, of porn and you're out. Right, right. They did give me community violations based on the previous panda porn, um, <laughs> by, you know, stuff. But I didn't know I had a limit until I would be permanently kicked off. They did not be like, hey, one more strike and you're gone. So I basically emailed them and I was like, there are little, there are minors, like there are boys wagging their dicks around in basketball shorts on your platform mm. with like millions of views. You're going to kick me off for making jokes about panda porn, really? Like, right. come on. And I do think it is, you hear a lot about how, Basically, poor looking people, people of color and gay people get per, per, or overweight people, like things like that, like get particularly attacked on, mm. not attacked, but like they're, they don't get the traction that other people get. 
like I'll have video, this is so inside baseball, but like according to the analytics, like I'll have videos with like 50% like rates, mm. which is insanely high. But insanely they high. They don't get put up to the top of the algorithm the way others do. And I think Interesting. It's because it's like gay content and they sort of like try to keep it away from. Do you have any idea of the, like the history of the company? Like, are they. Oh, they're Chinese. That's the big mm. issue. So you don't want to be fucking oh. around with pandas on a Chinese oh. platform. I thought you meant that was a big <laughs> issue. Like why they were like against no, those things. I was no, like, Oh, I didn't course. know about that. I yeah. just put this together. I thought right. it was a gay thing, but maybe they're mad about me taking down their national, their national animal. Like maybe they're like, you can't talk shit about pandas on this Chinese social media platform. I didn't know that they were Chinese. Well, pan oh, TikTok or pandas? TikTok. I didn't know that. Well, I didn't know. I definitely didn't know uh, pandas were Chinese, but I know. Asian, I guess. I didn't. Well, because so in the TikTok, because I, every time I try to download it, my phone crashed. I just got it on my phone. In the thing that says about the videos, when I Googled, like, looking for tips, they mentioned trying to look good on it, which I was surprised by. Try and look good. Get your lighting good. Like, make yourself look pretty. Yeah. Because normally places won't overtly say, because that, that is kind of like edging towards like the bet, you know, the better you look, the more likely we are, which yeah. is kind of implied in a lot of entertainment stuff anyway. Right, right. But, no, yeah. they're serious about it. it. It They have, their algorithms are crazy. I posted a clip today and it, I didn't even, I went to tag the other person who was in it, suggested it immediately. Oh, they were like, oh, that's Paige Cole. And oh, that's like, great. Whoa, like that like very fast they're it's, on it yeah and they have no bones about making it known what they know about you it's crazy. Hmm. 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 okay so i want to go way back into little ashley what were okay. you like as a little kid because what i want to get the full picture of it is there's a quote you had in an interview you did with go magazine where you talked about a void and wanting to fill a void and the like needing to do stand up as something that you needed to do and needing to achieve your goals for the void. So I want to get the idea of like when this void started like manifesting itself in a way you wow. can remember. I what think it's you- hard. I think it's hard to say when exactly that started, but my whole life I've known I'd wanted to be like an actor or performer hmm. or something like since, since I was a little, little kid, there's actually this funny video of me like playing my dad is like holding in the camera and I'm playing like circus or something and I like turn to camera and I'm like hey welcome to the three ring circus or whatever and then I stop and I audibly sigh and I go no and I turn around I put my head in my hands you can see that I'm talking to myself and then I go okay I turn back around and I do a second take at the line reading like same line but a second take so obviously something's been wrong with me for a really long time (laughs) um <laughs> how old were you like five four or five wow isn't that i'm so interested in nature versus nurture too oh, yeah, like yeah what plants the seed so you remember being kind of like a different little kid did you did you have a lot of friends growing up or like what were, what were you like in terms of like how I, you were I had a lot of friends but i was also like a floater like i mm-hmm. i didn't have like one click i kind of hung out with everybody everyone kind of knew me but um and i had a couple like close friends but i wasn't super clicky you know what i mean I just what kind of school public thing. or private oh i went to private school growing up i went to uh like an elite private school it was i'm the first person to be like it was awful <laughs> <laughs> i mean it was great like i appreciate the education but it was like uh it was it's tough to go to a school like that it's very cutthroat and it's not a normal experience like everyone is crazy wealthy except right. those who aren't and the disparity is huge um there's like it's better than it was now, but there were like a lot, there was like a lot of race stuff um, mm. and uh, no one was gay. I mean, that's kind of true everywhere. But. Would they talk about the race stuff or was it just? They really tried. And I actually went back for like this reunion thing that they were doing for the school. And now it is very diverse. Like mm. actually pretty, it's pretty amazing. But at the time they would talk so much about it, but you were like, how it, talking about it doesn't change the demographics of my sure. entire class you know sure was it how big was it oh, just like 100 kids per grade oh that's tiny yeah really small tiny yeah. so from a young age were you like i have to do well in school i have to do well in school no i think i really wanted i was very creative like i 
I, I taught myself to build websites in middle school. I would like wow. knit hats and sell them. And I was in the place and stuff. <laughs> and I just sort of saw like class as like this obstacle to me, like doing the things that I really wanted. Like I mm. love to learn. I love being creative, but like, I just wasn't interested in what school was teaching me. And in retrospect, I think that that like, I wish I could go back and be like, just do your fucking homework. Like, it's going to help. Like, long term, like, this is not helpful for your life. But um, at the time, I was like, I, I wanted to do my own little adventures. Would you get competitive with selling the hats? Like, how into the hat business were you? I was super into the hat business. That's what I'm I picturing. Way over, like, I had like I had little <laughs> spreadsheets and margins and shit. I was like, okay, one hat cost me $3 to make. So it, I can sell them for 15 and I, and uh, I would change my price based on how, how rich I knew the kid I was selling to was. So like kids on scholarship, they would get like $5 hats, but kids who, who weren't on scholarship, they were paying the full 15. So you were like cranking out the hats. I was cranking them out. Yeah. I had a pie business. Wish I had <laughs> some of that. In, oh, and I, but I was so into the pie business because I remember overhearing my mom and her friends at book club talking about pies. So I was like, can I, I'll, mom, I'm going to start selling your friend's pies. And I got really into the sales. You were selling the pies. You weren't selling the pies. You I would the middleman. I would make the pies, but they oh. fucking sucked. And so <laughs> my mom, who's a great cook, she started making the pies. And then I remember her saying, I can't buy all the ingredients and make the pies for you. And then you sell them to my friends. And I remember her saying, you know, it, my friends feel pressured to buy the pies <laughs> because they would be having book club or something. And then I would hover in and be like, does anyone want to buy a pie? <laughs> and weren't you like a chubby kid too? Yeah. 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 I'm like <laughs> eating the pie. I'm like, does anyone want to buy a pie? Yeah. 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 You guys want some pie? And they're like, <laughs> they have to say yes. They can't be like, well, we don't want to look like you. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I'm like this, but I remember my mom, finally like making me stop because she was like you gotta stop doing it but it is interesting to think that i because i do think a lot of people that get into performance are entrepreneurial kids i i think so too especially the ones who succeed i have this stupid vision board in my kitchen right now that says are you dane cook yet because wow. i've just been obsessively thinking about how dane cook like launched his own career on myspace and this whole time i've been like yeah, you know, this is stupid and like man, like manifest your dreams or whatever. But the day before I went viral on TikTok, I, I put it up on my vision board, like literally 24 hours before. So this is something that's interesting because I'm going to do a little side note. Lots of comedians do not admit an affinity towards Dane Cook. So you made this recently? Yeah, because listen, I have not listened to Dane Cook's comedy in a really long time. I'd be pretty entertaining if I, if I said, but the, he has a few jokes that I remember from when I was a kid that I'm like, that's a good joke. Like, say what you want about him. Like, I don't like it when comedians get overly um, critical of of the comedians who are more performative rather than sure. more technical. Totally agree with that. But, like, he has some super technical jokes that are almost masked by how performative he is. Absolutely. Like, like he talks about this breakups and how people come up with the dumbest reasons not to break up. And the punchline is he's like, I know a girl who like, um, I think my mic might be. We just had some tech issues that I'm gonna blame on Bowie. Ashley and I were discussing vision boards and she has a yes. vision board with Dane Cook and the title. Are you Dane Cook yet? Is what I asked because he really made his career on myspace with his fans and i was just feeling with my whole career i felt really ignored by industry and i was like i wonder if dane cook ever felt this way because he like launched himself on myspace and so many people give him shit <laughs> put it on my vision board next day went viral on tiktok charted on apple and wow Spotify. it was like yeah not that that was what you know i don't know i don't know but what we were saying was people people love to shit on dane cook like comedians who are like so into the technicalities of writing and like when people perf overperform, they like get they get like uh, you know sort of like pretentious about it. Sure. But I love good performers, and I still remember jokes that Dane Cook told from when I was like in high school. My favorite one: he's talking about breakups, and he's talking about the pe the reason people like don't leave relationships are so fucking <laughs> stupid. And he goes, "I know a girl where she was like, you don't understand, you I can't break up with him." My CDs are in his truck. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I will never, my CDs are in his truck. Like, Relatable. that's not incredible writing. Like, 
Just yeah. So good. So good. And he was good with specifics. He, he, I actually so was obs- specific. I was obsessed with him because I'm interested in his career trajectory. He talks about feeling ignored by the industry when he moved to LA. And really? then he, yes, he says, I was in New York and I couldn't get any traction. And then I went to LA and he, he, you haven't read this? No. And he asked Jamie Masada at the Laugh Factory. He says, just give me five minutes. I don't know if this is like true or blown up, but this is, I've seen him say this in interviews. And he goes on for five minutes. Jamie Masada loves him. He starts getting traction in LA. And then he's able to go back to New York and Boston. But when he was in New York, he wasn't getting traction. And then all of a sudden they they love him. Exactly. And this is exactly what I've been thinking. And I'm definitely going to railroad myself by putting this out to the internet, but like, be the, to the people who have called me developmental when the only thing that will have changed is that the same comedy that I've been showing them for years is now on TikTok getting hundreds of thousands of views. Like, yeah, you didn't you know, know about the fucking pandas yet. You didn't yeah. know what I had on my feet with those goddamn pandas. Don't kill me out. I'm an innovator. You think I'm just doing camp comedy? Nah, 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 nah. I'll get in a fucking... Cat Williams has a joke where he talks about trying shit and trying shit don't work. Trying shit and trying shit don't work. Trying... Ashley's trying shit, trying shit, trying shit, trying shit. Fucking boom, pandas. <laughs> pandas. And pandas. that's what happens. That's what happens. Then people circle back like it's the first time they ever met you. And you're like, no, motherfucker. Exactly. exactly. Oh, yeah. I've known you. Yeah, yeah. We have we have emails. We have correspondence. Um, but I'm not shooting myself yeah. in the foot right now by saying all of this. I mean, maybe not. I don't know. Not at all. I, I, I highly doubt any of the, you know what? It doesn't matter anyway. They don't even it, care. They don't care. They, they care about the number on my profile. And they wouldn't have the self-awareness. Those people that <laughs> would be like right. that wouldn't have the self-awareness to know you're talking about them. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's another thing. So with it's so true. With problematic, nar- maybe narcissistic types, they'd be like, yeah, fuck that motherfucker. And you're like, oh, I'm talking about you. Rude, <laughs> rude, rude. So you're, you're a kid in the school that sounds like it's in a bubble. Did you want to get out of that? Were you like craving getting out of that bubble? Yeah, I loved like, I went to summer camp every summer. And Are you that, Jewish? I'm a quarter Jewish. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you for figuring it out. Usually yes. it's Midwest. It's like people who don't know Jews are like, are you Jewish? Because they've like never met a Jew and they can like smell the littlest bit on me. Right. But Jews <laughs> and comedians and people from New York are like, you're Jewish? Um, you, you, it's just so funny. It was the summer camp tipped me off. It I always think summer camp thing. Summer yeah. camp is a very, because I went to Jewish summer camp and that's why I, I hear summer camp. I go, oh, I know about that. Are you Jewish? It, it, I, no, I went to Jewish okay. summer camp because I wanted to go to summer camp and then I get there and, and you realize fucking, everyone's Jewish. Everybody is Jewish. Camp and you're Kohut. Aryan. You are Aryan. I know Kohut. I know really? Kohut. Yeah. I went there for like eight summers. Um, I went to uh, Alford Lake, but my camp was super waspy. That's the thing. I was. That's like, why really I should have gone with. Right, you would have fit in real well. It was all girls named Emma with blonde hair from New England. Something got scrambled because yeah. mine was fuck. Mine was 100 percent Jewish. Camp Kohut spelled camp with a k kohut k o just jewish i know i know camp kohut and i don't jewish. think i would have liked it as much but um because I, it's co-ed right yeah but everything is very separate boys cabins and girls cabins every mm-hmm. like archery tennis all of that's like separate separate separate, separate. you oh, don't wow, see okay. the boys except for at the dance which was very uncomfortable did you did you dance yeah, it was awful. We didn't. <laughs> it was awful, Ashley. It was awful. It was like, because everyone was in an outfit. I remember everyone had to wear the same. You had a camp outfit that you wore every day, and I felt comfort in that. Yes. And then the we dance also, was. I love the uniform. The uniform loved. is, it's the great equalizer. It is. I think, yeah, I love a uniform. Did you have a uniform at the prep school? No, no. Yeah. See, because then they say, well, now the, the, you, the dance, you get to wear whatever you want. And I just remember feeling... And girls go all out. Girls go all out. I felt so much panic. I was also overweight at the time, but I, I literally got my period at summer camp. And I, that, <laughs> while, while, while I was out boating. I was a counselor. We prepared for that. I, it, yeah. I had a girl get her period for the first time at camp. It's, but that, the anxiety around getting my period while I'm on a boat at summer camp doing water skiing lessons was nothing compared to the anxiety <laughs> around the fucking dance. But so you, what, you loved going away to summer camp? Yeah, because I just felt like it was a not, it, we had the uniform, it wasn't about, even though everyone had money because it was summer camp, but it wasn't about money, it was like simple living, we didn't have electricity, there wasn't popularity. Really? There were boys, there were, yeah, it took away my sexuality too, I'm, if anyone didn't know from We're Having Gay Sex, the podcast, um, I am oh, gay. I should have put that in your intro that that was No, it. don't worry yeah. about it. 
um, it's actually kind of refreshing for it not to be like the first thing that we talk about. All I've been talking about is how gay I am. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm gay. And when I went to camp, even though it was all girls, because there were no boys, it took sexuality out. You know what I mean? So because you didn't have to pretend? I didn't have to pretend. It wasn't something that we were talking about. And so I could just be a kid for exactly who I was mm. rather than, oh, Ashley's cool, but like something's off. <laughs> you know? Ashley's cool, but why is she looking at me like that? She's fucking right. talking about pandas. <laughs> <laughs> Can you put that costume away? Yeah, um, exactly. But, exactly. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I felt like at school, people kind of knew. You know really? In seventh grade, there were these four of us that couldn't go to gym for a long period of time. Like, I broke my leg. Simone Rutkowitz had mono. Andrew Modell, I don't know what the hell was wrong with him. I want to say this. It's so funny to me, and I tried writing about this. People talk about people from high school. They say their whole names. Their whole names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and Elena Serkin, she had, like, a cough, a horrible cough mm. for a long time. I remember that. And we would, we, it was like breakfast club. We were like all from different cliques and shit like that. And we How'd you talk. break that leg? How did I, I, bro- I broke it playing soccer. I broke it ah. fucking a panda. Um, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> they are very strong. The truth is all coming out. <laughs> I can't believe um, they kicked me off. I was just posting things about panda porn. These fucking <laughs> homophobic assholes yanked me out. I didn't okay. even get to my ostrich porn. It's these fucking. <laughs> That's the good shit. Yeah. Those necks, ah, uh, beautiful. But, um. So the- you couldn't go to gym class. Yeah, and we're like we we were sitting around, and they were all talking about the crushes that they had, mm. and my heart is pounding. You know what I mean? Fuck, I gotta do the whole. Oh, there's a there's a boy from another school. Right. And uh, then Andrew looks at me, and I like this guy. He's a nice guy. I'm not. I didn't feel bullied or any. Well, th- not bullied, but he looks at me and he goes, "Ashley, do, do you like boys?" Like very sincerely, <clears throat> like not in a not in a way. But because I was so right. closeted and fearful, of course, I, I, I just, my heart was racing and I wanted to like die. I just mm. like, and I was like, how does he know that? Right. And now I'm like, well, duh. <laughs> but at the time I felt like, how do they see it? Like, how do they know that I'm different? And, um, I wonder yeah, what he was picking up on. Maybe it was, I mean, <laughs> well, I, and I wasn't joking when I said that. I don't, were you, did you, would you put on an act to seem have feminine? Great. No, I was a tomboy for sure. And I didn't care about clothes and fashion and stuff like that. And I liked sports and I was funny. Mm. And I think that can be a sign. Like there are very few female class clowns when you're growing up. I feel like most of the class clowns are boys. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. I I, I think that that's actually really interesting. Humor. Well, I've, I've thought about because being loud and taking up a lot of space is usually something men are so were socialized to be comfortable with and is acceptable um and you know yeah that is interesting that there i'm trying to think if we had female class clowns i yeah and i was very much that way i was super obnoxious i was always trying to be funny and make everybody laugh especially like eighth grade i think that's when i started really liking girls and my hormones started going and Mm. i was like oh i can make girls laugh Like this is, it's not sexual, you know what I mean? Like this is a way that I can talk to and impress girls was my sense of humor. Humor can be, there's this guy, a guy named Donnie Deutsch and he wrote this. Donnie Deutsch came to my school. (laughs) Really? Did an assembly. I cannot believe we're talking about that. That's incredibly random because that is this. Okay. So Donnie Deutsch is this guy who's huge in advertising and he's also really into inventions. And I read his book forever ago. He had a TV show, The Big Idea with Donnie Deutsch. <laughs> so I was really into Donnie Deutsch. I haven't talked about Donnie Deutsch in, I'm going to say, um, 200 years, by the way. So that I brought him up right now is very random. My classmates roasted Donnie Deutsch. They roasted Okay, his him. tan's a little fucked up. But this is why, the reason I bring him up is because <laughs> he had a quote in his book that he got in trouble for. But he was saying, you want to be able to flirt with all your employees. And he says, and I don't mean sexual, I mean in terms of a banter. And he says in the book, he's like, with male employees, I want to have a banter with female employees. And it's not sexual. And he said something about it being humorous, where he's like, you, and, and I think that, that that connects to that idea where it's like, you're making jokes with girls, you're having a humorous interaction that's elevated from a general conversation. It's, it's playful, and there's right. a connection. Right. And you're like, 
you're riffing off each other. It's chemistry. I think what he should have said chemistry. is chemistry, but chemistry. You want to create chemistry with all of exactly. Your you want to create chemistry with the people you work with because sometimes people have really great like on screen chemistry, and you can see it. And when you're watching them like do the sex scene or the kiss scene, you're like, yep. oh, they definitely dated. And maybe they're not even too attracted to each other, but right. they have such good chemistry that you can right. feel that they're vibing. Absolutely. He spoke at your school. Your school yeah. must have been your school. That must have been well to do that. Actually, I, it was a bougie. It was yeah. a bougie school. The hell was he <laughs> talking about? I don't even remember. It was high school, and the whole thing at my school is that all the kids were so fucking smart. But in addition to that, they they were very argumentative. Lots of children of lawyers. Um, ah, and and, mm. and they loved being argumentative, and they wanted to win the Ugh, argument. So whenever there was me. like. Uh, a guest that seemed like wasn't perfect, you know, and I'm trying to think what a perfect guest would be, but right. anyone who came to our school, it was just all about roasting the fuck out of the person on stage. Like, can I outsmart this person, this adult who just, wow. so, so disrespectful. Well, it's a, it's, <laughs> it's like, it's a educate, it, it is like a high school an educated high school thing. Cause it's like high school kids do like to roast and talk shit but to feel the entitlement to i can challenge yes. this person openly and the repercussions won't be like that totally. you know what i mean i think about when i was at girls who code and i had all these students from public schools and public schools that you had to test into and these kids were so smart mm. i loved them so much but they were very respectful they would mm. never ever ever treat a guest like that ever did you ever wrote were you roasting the people too no and mm. one time this musician came to the school and I like raised my hand and I asked like a very <laughs> honest question. I was always asking questions at assembly. Um, and, uh, I, I remember people like made fun of me cause I was like so sincere in hmm. the way that I, um, that I, <laughs> that I asked the question. I, I just didn't fit in. I didn't, I love roasting. I just like, I'm too, I have a big soft, I'm, I'm a cornball. I'm a cornball right. for sure. And I, I have always been that way. And I cry a lot. And really? Good for yeah, you. I, cr I cry a lot. What's um, the difference I'm overly between, sensitive. What's the difference between roasting and talking shit though? Because I'm down to talk shit, but roasting, I've ne roasting I never get into. I don't think I'm a good shit talker. Really? I don't know. I feel like if I'm talking shit, it's because I really, I, it's like genuine. Oh yeah. I thought I don't oh yeah. Person. Oh yeah. But I, I'm talking. Whereas roasting behind closed doors. I guess doors. they were talking. Roasting is more of an act of love. Interesting. Oh, that's interesting. So I but wouldn't I, have thought of it high like school, that. In high school, it was not, it was not, it was like um, a, a, a dick measuring contest. Mm, yeah, that makes total sense. So you always felt kind of different. Was there any place you could be like your true self? At camp, I could be my true self at camp and I would do stand up at like campfire and like theatrical oh, performances and stuff. Gee, what do you mean? Yeah, like, would you yeah. actually tell Joe? Did you watch enough stand up to like emulate that? I I, I didn't know I want. This is so weird because like I didn't know I wanted to be a comedian. I knew I wanted right. to be a performer, but like I never thought I can be a comedian. Um, might be a lack of female representation at the time. Um, well, were people but, watching uh, comedy around you when you were growing up? I watched Comedy Central. All oh, the time. okay, okay. So you knew yeah, it was. A I thing. don't know why I never. Yeah, and I would, like, do, like, there was a dog at the camp that the directors had, and I would, like, make fun of the dog, and um, just, like, uh, You're not a panda. Okay, I'll stop that. Out. You know what I'm <laughs> I would never fuck you, because I don't fuck dogs. I only fuck exotic, endangered species. Um, but, yeah, uh, <laughs> stupid dog. Um, but <laughs> so you would stand up and do jokes at the campfire? Yeah, like, everyone else would, like, huh. read a poem. Or like sing a song from Rent, and I would uh, do stand up. Or like wow. an original, I would do like song parody. Hmm. Like there, like I wrote um, "Eating Your Favorite Lobster," the lobster song to the mm. tune of uh, "Living La Vida Loca." Oh wow! That was a big hit. Wow, that yeah. seems like a real stretch from those actual lyrics. It. W I'm not gonna sing it because you can if you want. This is such a deep cut. I'm Safe space. Uh, thank you. No, live in La Vida Loca, eating your favorite lobster. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now I get it, now I get it. It's yeah, good yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> and industry has been sleeping on me. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, stuff like that. 
when you went when you went from high school to Bryn Mawr, was there any pause? Were you like, I need to, because Bryn Mawr is a very, Bryn Mawr would probably be pretty in line with the high school that you went to. So when I, Bryn Mawr was a turning point. That was like when my senior year, I was like, am I on theme? Am I doing this right? By yeah. The way, I should have listened to your podcast. Okay. Oh, don't be, f- no, the, my, I want to get to, I'm trying to ask questions that I'm curious about getting to know to paint the profile on someone. Cool, cool. So I, I don't have an angle besides or the first dates, but the thing too is I, I want to, I always feel like I like talking to people where I, I think one theme that's been emerging is extracting like a positive takeaway from mm. it. Cause I do think there's, you know, there's stuff to learn that we can learn from anybody, but I feel like as you like paint the picture of someone who is doing what they want to do, there are inspiring elements in that yes you know so i can i can stay on that so when i was a senior i discovered computer science i had already sort of been dabbling because i taught myself to build websites which isn't exactly computer science but then senior year i did this amazing teacher who was like why aren't you taking computer science like that's so weird but they wouldn't let me because my math grades were so bad and then this fucking math yeah yeah these new teach this new teacher came in and he was like let her do this mr campbell gordy shout out the best i fucking love that guy he best teacher of my whole life um and he was like take computer science and um i did and i loved it and i thought oh this is more practical than going to theater school or art school or something like that were you doing theater while you were in high school yeah i was like in all the plays and stuff like that and i really oh i begged my mom to help me like audition and get an agent mm, and stuff like really? that. really yeah oh yeah i wanted to so since i was like 11. how like, would she I, respond to that she didn't know she didn't know what to do she had no i don't think she wanted me to at the time although she's very supportive now but like at i relate time, to that ashley yeah I relate to that. I was always telling my mom, I wasn't saying I wanted to be a performer. I was saying I wanted to make it an entertainment and I wanted to be in the music business as some kind of manager, agent. And I only said that. I truly don't know why. I don't know what it was. It might have been a part of you holding yourself back a little bit. Could have been. Yeah, could have been. it. But I, would, I was just infatuated with entertainment and I would always talk to my mom about it. And she, it was, she was just like, where is this coming from? Why are you yes. talking about this? Like, because it's a hard life. And I think yeah. my mom really didn't want me to have that hard life. Sure. You know what I mean? So she really didn't know what to do. I was so motivated. And then I think I got in my head, maybe from that, that this isn't a good idea. And so when I found computer science and it was so creative and fun, I thought, oh, I'll do that instead. So then I applied to Bryn Mawr. Um, I got Bryn Mawr, moved- all women's? All women's, yeah. yeah, women's college. And Were you out of the closet at this point? No, great. I don't regret, so this is the thing, like, sometimes I'll be like, I wish I hadn't even gone to college and just started stand-up. But then mm-hmm. other times, when I reflect on coming out at Bryn Mawr, it was such a non-issue. Sure. That I'm like, you know what, maybe that was like a good, a good thing to have had in my life. To come out, so I went to all women's, I went to Simmons in Boston, which is a small, private, all liberal, or liberal arts women's college. Yeah. Coming out in that setting is such a gift that's easy to forget because I'll see, I, I truly don't know if I had come out, if I hadn't come out in that setting, and even in that setting, when? yeah, when? And that, and we're both fucking gay as all fuck. We're so gay. So gay. So for it, so, and I remember too i didn't even come out on my own i was yanked out by this fucking girl angela you were yanked i was out. yanked out ashley i remember getting to campus and there was this this quad and i remember being on the quad and this girl oh she's like I- i'm not i'm not making this up she's big physically big she had a drinking thing she ended up leaving the school <laughs> she's across the campus she yells at me she's like we're gonna make out of the party and Whoa. I'm like, get her away. Go to the party. I remember she's drunk and she's like stumbling in this doorway and she starts looking at me. She goes, well, I haven't made out yet. And I was like, huh? And then I make oh out God. with her. And that's who I had my first female sexual experience with her. But she- <laughs> Her name was Angela? And she, but I'm so grateful for Angela because she ripped me out of the closet. I don't think I would have come- Thank This is like- next, Angela. <laughs> so grateful for my So ex. grateful. I couldn't, I, she just was so- fucking pushy and i wasn't really attracted to her i knew i, didn't, I never wanted to hold her hand like i she was really 
had a partying problem. She was always like, she's like trying to get me to skip class and call. I was like, get the wow, fuck out. Real life peer pressure. Real in co- school special. In college. That's so crazy. She tried to light a fire in the quad. Like it was a what fucking, the fuck? it was a, she was a true mess, but she yanked me out and I'm so grateful for that. But so you came out there. <laughs> Angela, you- if you're listening from prison right now, we yeah. are so grateful that you helped Emma come out of the quad. Now she's an attorney. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I found her on- um, Is she I found, sober? I, she's got to be. I know she was in and out of rehab stuff. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. something, but she like fucking ripped me out. What, were you ripped out or did you, were you, did you, were you just, did no, you I, you know, out? in the beginning of college, there were some girls who were like, I think knew that I was gay <laughs> and I was saying, of course, Bryn Mawr, but they were like, wait, they were pretty much mostly respectful about it but there were kids in my own class who like told me who were like spreading rumors about me the fact that really? I really yeah the fact that I couldn't come out they were like well she's mm. homophobic or whatever <gasps> I was like okay give me give me some time please I where would they get here. homophobic from like because I hated myself ah you know what I mean and yes I, I did didn't we all but didn't we um, all yeah and, and so I but then I met a girl second semester and I just I was just loved her so much and was she out it, no, she she identifies as straight. She's hooked up with a couple other women, I think, mm-hmm. and had sex with one other woman, but she was like mostly straight. I guess she's like sort of queer, like a little right. bit bi or whatever. Um, she, and she doesn't lie about it. She's not like in the closet about it. Right. She's just like mostly straight. Right. Um, and she's super cool and we're still friends. Uh, but I I just remember like I didn't even have to come out. I just like started holding her hand around mm. campus and it was just like so normal. And yeah. I don't think even at the liberalist college in the entire world, if it's co-ed, I just don't think that you can have that. I just really don't think that it's possible. And mm. I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful for that. So you studied the computer, you studied the computer stuff. Were you missing entertainment or were you just, was it just not even in your brain? Oh, I missed, I missed the creative outlet at Bryn Mawr so much. That was like my love hate relationship with it. Great place to like find my feminist identity great place to come out great place party did you party no not at all Bryn Mawr's not a party school mm. at all we've won party a year the Halloween party that was wow. it. that was the one thing that we had that was like sort of huge there were like some traditions or stuff but I wasn't like super into that either. no pot no no I'm I don't drink or smoke because I have family history so I just never started good for you so you've never smoked pot in your whole life Never in my whole life. Wow, good for you. My drug experiences are like Vicodin after my wisdom teeth came oh. out and that shit. Yeah, just straight up hard narcotics. Yeah, I was like, like oh. I've never smoked pot, but yeah. I have a Vicodin guy. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, uh, yeah, Vicodin after remember, wisdom teeth. Yeah, I remember feeling one day after with the wisdom teeth, after a couple days of the Vicodin, I was like, damn, I really want to feel the way that the Vicodin makes me yeah. feel. Like literally a couple days. Right. And I was like, this is why you don't do drugs. Right. Because this is you somehow knew, thank God, because of your upbringing, that you have an addictive personality. Sure. And you shouldn't be doing this shit. Um, yeah. And I, I just like, I get very like food. Like I lost 50 pounds. Like, oh my God. Food, I, for me. food me too, 100%. I just hundred percent very triggering in front of me. I will eat it. It doesn't matter if I like it. It doesn't matter if it's what it is. If I feel sick, if I feel full, I know you lost 50 pounds about like, like 45. Good for you. Who's keeping count (laughs) me every day. Um, but yeah, so we're using, we're using food as we're using food as a coping mechanism. You think, or you just like the way it tastes. I do. I love the way it tastes. I love the way it makes my brain feel. Like oh my god isn't that the sugar? truth oh yeah sugar i try to tell my girlfriend i go i'm like because i'll be walking around a supermarket and i'll i go i can feel the sugar i can yeah. feel it if i'm walking through and you feel the confection the confection sugar and i'll say i want to put it in my nose i want to fucking put that <laughs> sugar in my butt like i just want the sugar i don't want to just eat it normally i want to get it i want to yeah because it does something it, for it sure. does something it, it does something but now you know what? The other day when they banned my TikTok, I cannot believe how much we're talking about this. Hey, but it was a big, it was banned, a big thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a thousand followers a day is pretty, pretty big. But sure. um, after they banned it, I, I, I've been exercising a lot more. Great. And the one thing that my brain told me to do was like, you gotta go for a run. Sure. And I was like, this is the addiction I need my brain to yes, be doing. Like, totally. Thank, thank you, brain, for rewiring yourself to be like, go for a run. That's yep. so cool. 
something like, to take care of I you. That's how I am. I like, I, I have like, a, if it makes me feel good, I want, I want it. And I'm like acutely yep. aware of that. When did the vision board start coming into your life? Like, when did you start mapping out goals like that? This is Emma. This is the deep shit. Mm-hmm. Okay. So like two or three years ago, I began a downward spiral in my career. I was supposed to be on a particular late night program, but then mm-hmm. that late night program suspended comedy on the show for like Not indefinitely. Right. I'm sure you heard about that from some people. And then um, I was had like people who were supposed to come to some big show of mine and the, the door girl didn't let them in because it was sold out and they arrived a little bit late. I had like a cycle, my, you know, I had a cycle of like, really bad luck and also me making like impulsive decisions because of the bad luck that I was question having. question yeah. was this was this cycle the spiral 100% brought on by career stuff or did you have other life stuff going on that I had it? I was in a toxic relationship right. and so I the stew say, was the stew was being prepped for a fucking problem yes Th- these breakdowns yes. I think don't just happen from if it's something truly like pierces through everything like like a, a death or a, a death, yeah. so, but if it's something or if it's like okay corona happened i'm unemployed i am depressed yes. boom it links yes. to that but if it's something else it's a it, stew to be fair it was a lot of career shit one after another but right. it was also my toxic relationship and also like just like it was just uh my i had some family shit going on it was really bad i got super depressed and i started feeling uh, not just, I feel like everyone can have suicidal thoughts. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. And I had had that my whole life. Me too. And, suicidal and, ideation. Yes, yes. Yeah. But this turned into, oh, well, this is something I'm considering. Absolutely. And when I realized that. First I time was, seriously considering it, you think? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm, maybe once or twice before, but like for an extended period of time. And I realized, like, okay, comedy, I love comedy. I'm going to die before I stop doing comedy, but comedy wow. might be trying to kill me. So sure. I have to figure out how to manage this. I, Emma, I went super deep into self-help shit so much. And then a couple months later, I started meditating. I meditate every day, hmm. 20 minutes a day. I've been doing it for almost two years now straight without a day off. I Oh, and also my therapist of um, uh, several decades told me that he was dying and I, I didn't have an eighth. So like a lot, a lot was happening. And I finally was like, I got to get happy. I got to change everything. I'm going to Your therapist told you this. And your therapist told you he was dying. Why this was going on? Yeah. All this was going God, on. Fuck. That was the, that was the darkest day. Yeah. That, you know, that's a big one too. A therapist saying they're dying because, um, uh, I almost wouldn't want to know. Uh, um, I, I'd be I'm like, just keep fucking me. going and then I'll figure it out. But I, I'm, I'm sure it's better for him to tell you, but yeah, that's a real, because yeah. did he have a specific date, or was he like just as a heads up? He gave me a appreciate. year. We're we're almost at the end of that year, so <gasps> it's almost over. But what what it did to me was I rock bottomed sort of right. emotionally, and I was like, "You need to find a way to be happy because you have some of the best therapy in the world with a therapist who literally knew your parents, knows your parents. You you're like you should not you should be a happy person. Like you have a great life. Like what is going on? Right. So. I took this fucking happiness course from Yale on Hold Coursera. Up. Ashley, my mom took a happiness course and I've never heard anyone else talk about one. My it, mom took one at Harvard. So it's life changing. Yeah. They have you, there are eight activities that you're supposed to do every day. You fold them in as you take the course. I had Please tell been, me them. Please tell me them. I'd already been meditating. I started exercising. I okay. exercise five times a week. And you don't have to go crazy. I, you practice gratitude every night. That's super fast. Yeah. You sleep. You get your eight hours and you take it fucking seriously. Yeah. You don't put the phone in your bed. You don't watch TV in bed. You don't bring the computer into bed. You go to bed when you go to bed. I feel like this is very personal right now. You, you have to, you do a savoring activity. That's sort of hard to explain. What's a savoring? Like if you're going to eat ice cream or yeah. if you're looking at a beautiful sunset, you really be there in that got it, got it, got it, got you it. take eight minutes to savor the activity, which and coincidentally is the number of minutes that you should be meditating every day. Interesting. 
um, and uh, you do an act of kindness. That's the hardest one for me, time-wise, to do every day. Uh, it's the hardest one for me because I hate fucking people. Right. Um, well, you so, also living in New York. It's it's yeah. But also, there's people all over. You could do an act of kindness. Could be just get, you sometimes know. I give like a big tip or right. like you know what whatever it might be. Um, and you connect. You have to have social interaction every day with somebody. I started doing them. I went from couldn't get out of bed suicidal to feeling pretty good in six weeks. And a few, in a few months after that, I went to the doctor, you fill out the form, you know what I mean? Have you thought about suicide? And I realized in that moment, I have been thinking about suicide pretty much daily Mm -hmm. my entire life. Mm. I hadn't thought about killing myself in six months. And I was like, this is it. This is how, and now I am, dude, I'm like in a fucking, people are probably listening to this, like, this girl's in a cult, she's in a cult. I'm going to tell you right now, no. Okay. Because here's the thing, happiness is an incredible thing, so it's also like, even if someone was in a cult, if they're happy, okay, that's probably not genuine happiness because it's like led by like a blindness, but who said this? I don't know who fucking said it. I remember someone saying, if you're happy, you win. And they said that to me, you might get a kick out of this. I was in Boston. I'm watching this comedian who's very funny, very funny. And I was watching him and he had gotten a lot of stuff from the business very quickly, but he didn't, couldn't hack it because he didn't like going on auditions and he had moved to New York. He moved back to Boston. And I was watching him and I said, man, if I had 10 minutes of his material, if I had, if I, I, I would milk that into an hour. I go, I could yeah. hustle 25% of what he's saying yeah. up there into so much shit. I was like, and he just didn't want to do this work and that yes, work. Yes, yes. And the, and I'm on a date and, oh man, this girl was smoking hot. <laughs> oh, she was so hot. I can't believe I brought her to this like scuzz bucket of a show. <laughs> Where she, was the show? It was in this back bar this irish bar in boston that at 10 p.m on a wednesday would have a comedy contest that actually started at like 1 a.m wow so this is a while ago while ago everyone would well you could drop by and do spots on it too so there people do but if you did the contest then after you do your five minutes of material they'd have everyone stand on stage and the guy would put his hand over everyone's head and whoever got the biggest applause would win so in real time you're getting rejected or not i hate i hate competitions like that oh it's brutal and women but oh interesting that's interesting yeah so she's next to me and she said, I go, yeah, this fucking guy, if I had this, and she goes, or maybe he's happy. And I was like, what? She was like, maybe he doesn't want the same things you want. Right. So maybe what you want wouldn't make him happy. So he's happy with what he's doing. And she was like, and she was a social worker. So she was like, if you're happy, you know, you win. She was like, the only yes. competition is with yourself. So if you're happy, you win. So whatever the, whatever it is that makes someone happy, you should feel like proud of figuring that out because- I mean, I take antidepressants. I didn't take the happiness class. I went straight to Wellbutrin. Well, they, they, and they say that that exercise is. Uh, my cat just tried to jump up on a thing and fell off. That was really cute. Is he um, okay? Yeah, he's all right. <laughs> um, but uh, they say exercise is 80% more effective against depression than- But sometimes it's so hard to exercise. It's so hard. I get it. Emma, when I started exercising, I hadn't exercised in over a decade. Mm. And I just, I downloaded an app and it was like, run for 30 seconds, walk for 30 seconds. And that's how I- (sighs) I'm not trying to be a dick to anyone out there. I I mean, I was at exercising. I can, I- I've started and stopped a bunch and I definitely can trace it. I mean, it, when I do it, I'm like, if I did this, I, this makes me feel better. And then I, I don't know why sometimes I just stop doing it. So that's the good part of my addictive behavior. The good mm. part about my addictive behavior is I keep a track, like the Jerry Seinfeld track. Yep. Like I haven't broken the chain and I'm so obsessed with that because I have problems. I'm so obsessed with like not breaking the chain that I keep up it's my it's my neuroses feeding into my behavior in a good mm. way rather than a bad way, which is I have, nice. I have a question about the suicidal ideation. Sure. Do you remember when it very first came into your life where you thought it was an option? Probably I the ideation started probably in high school or college. Mm. If it, it, I don't have a specific memory, but it just feels like that was around the time because by the time I was 22 and working my first job, it was very present. 
because I yes. was I was already depressed and wondering why my life was the way that it was and and why I wasn't happy. And it's interesting so, too yeah. because your first job was on paper so, probably something that should be like wow. I, but if it's some, job. if something's job. not right for you, then it's not right for you. And yeah. I think that's where a lot of self medication comes in because it's when people start doing that game of well, and it's awful when someone's like, but you should be happy. What's your problem? Exactly. Yeah. People, yeah. I have a family member where she struggles with depression and people, and I'm not saying that, but it's really me. I'd be open about it. But there's a family member. People are always like, she should be happy. Your life's perfect. I'm like, well, maybe she's fucking got some unresolved shit yeah. or who knows, or she's living a life that's not, that's not true or to her brain chemistry. Cause there are people out there where this, what I'm doing isn't the solution. True. That's and a good they, point. They might've tried it and maybe, you know, like Gary Goleman style, you need them the highest level of intervention. Yes. Um, we don't, I don't want to say to them, Oh, just go for a run because like, right. that's fucked up. Right. It would never, but you know, we have to be, it's, it's what worked for uh, you. Yeah. This is what worked for me. So how hard is it to, have you struggled with dating and finding people that will genuinely accept your level of commitment to the things you need to do for yourself and your career? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not so much recently, but in the beginning of my career, I was dating this girl where I think there was a moment where she was like, she saw comedy as a thing that could be mutually exclusive against her. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like I would, it, she saw it as a choice between me doing a show and going on a date with her. Mm. Whereas if you flip it, I don't see it as a choice when you go into work during the day, not to hang out with me. Cause I'm, that's when I'm home. Right. I would right. never impose that on you, but because my career is of a different style, you see me as the other and the weird one. And I'm the one that, that has the fucked up, whatever. So I am so glad that relationship ended for other reasons. She's super Was this cool. the toxic one that you were talking about? No, no, different one. Um, <laughs> I have like a really fucked up relationship past. Uh, yeah. Uh, we could do a whole episode on that. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I'm in a, I'm, I'm dating a girl right now and I'm so happy. It's the first, I think, truly healthy relationship I've ever been wow. in. Wow. I'm, like, I'm like, oh, this is what that feels like. It's have you so had to make compromises different. yet? No, not really. Oh, that's so. My therapist told she's me she's very she, supportive. That my therapist is she there right now? Uh, no, she's oh. not. She's, she's I don't I don't know if she can hear this. But. Oh, I I my therapist said she's like I think your relationship now is the first relationship you've been in, which is quite the statement because I've been in so many wow, fucking wow, like, wow. so many relationships, and I was like, why do you say that? And she goes, because you're having to make compromises, uh, and compromises because we live together, where it's right. like literally like take out the fucking trash or do this or do that. So she was like, you're having to adjust your life. And I have been very, my life mm, is the life mm. I've created. For me, it's I do too much to, to accommodate. I, I turn myself into a, a victim and like a, like a slave to the other person. I do that in the beginning. For the first so, eight months, I do that in a way that's not sustainable at all. And then I, not it's sustainable, not sustainable. Not healthy. Yeah. And what it might, I, it might sound like I'm trying to like, talk myself up i'm not at all like when you do that for another person what you're trying to do is present a fake version of yourself like look how subservient mm -hmm. i am to you and it's totally it's very toxic don't do it, it very toxic kind of behavior it's not yep. good it's also a lack of self-confidence in hey i would be enough and i'm offering enough without offering all of these things that are so yes. above and beyond like it's like a fear of if i'm just what I could actually be in would work. I won't be enough. So let me yes. let me go so far in the other direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in in my toxic relationship, I I was a part of it because I did things like that. And I offered things that I couldn't follow through on really that I wanted to be able to follow through on that were just not realistic or right at all. Right. So like, you know what I mean? I don't know. I and I contributed to it in 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 a way that might sound like i was like oh, such a great girlfriend but like it was like really stupid stuff and then they get sideswiped when you want to end the relationship <laughs> because if you're doing all this stuff for them or i found if you're doing all this stuff that's not sustainable then when you go to end it it's like they don't they're know blind, and they're blindsided blindsided yeah. yeah okay so i have some first date questions for you because i am just interested in first dates because it's interesting how people like present themselves on yeah it's interesting. At first, it's almost like the in-person ad of yourself. <laughs> but before I ask you these first date questions, which, by the way, haven't I Googled ones for lesbians, and these are pretty fucking unbelievable. 
but do you remember your first like actual date date? And did it's you ever go- because I did closeted dating? Okay, you know what I mean, when I was in high school, I uh, had a girlfriend in really? eighth, ninth grade. Yeah, oh, I loved her, and so we had some dates like that. And then when I was in college, it was like we hooked up, and it was like. Um, but what but about date? Date date. You know. Oh, there's two. There's one that's so, so sad. What happened? Okay, so I was in my long term, I was in this long distance relationship for six years. It was on again, off again, on again, off again. And during one of the offs, I matched with this girl on OkCupid. And we, I thought we were joking around. She was like, oh, I'm, I'm learning how to code because I was at Girls Who Code at the time. She was like, oh, I'm learning how to code. It's so hard. I was like, ah, I could teach you because that was right. literally my job to teach right. people how to code. And she was like, really? And I was like, yeah. And I thought it was sort of like a cute flirt, flirt medium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you're an get- accountant. Like, oh, I want someone to do my taxes. Like, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're on and I was okay, Cupid. And I was gonna, I was gonna teach her to code. Like that was true. But I also thought it would be like a flirty, fun date. We because you're on OK coffee. Cupid, you're not on LinkedIn. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. So we meet at this coffee shop. We have zero chemistry, zero chemistry. So it was literally like a one hour tutoring session of teaching her how to code. And then she went home and we never spoke to each other again. And I didn't get paid and I paid for the coffee. So I, I, cause you know, that's how it is. So that was my first online lesbian date. Mm. My next one that I consider more real was with this super girl, super cool girl named Iris who was getting her PhD in like cognitive, like something, something mm. super, super cool, super hot. She was like from, I think Denmark or mm. something. She was so cool. I really liked her. And it was right after my six year relationship had ended. And it was the first time that I felt like hope. I was mm. like, I know this girl's not the one, but she was so cool. And I was attracted to her. And and I wanted to go on a second date. I had to reschedule the first date for a comedy show. Mm. We were planning our second date. I was like, hey, I'm so sorry. I got booked on another show. Can we reschedule? And she ghosted me after I said Really? That. Yeah. So just to say that there are people out there who won't date you because you're a comedian. There really, really are. But that was cool. Would you Have you ever gone on a date with a more masculine woman? One time I accidentally went on a date <laughs> with a more masculine woman because she was so stunningly beautiful. Mm. She had like long hair and, and dressed sort of kind of the way I dress, like right. not super masculine, but also not super femme, but she was so gorgeous. And I was just like, oh, I have to meet her. And then she walked in and swag, so much swag. I know exactly what you mean. Walking yeah. through the door. And we both looked at each other and we're like, well, Oops. you're very cute. Right, but right. This will never work. Right. <laughs> so, so, totally. Yeah, yeah. I dated one of those. It, it, she was cute, she was so beautiful, and she did actually dress more. She did dress more feminine, but there was like this the energy. There was a swag. I mean, sm- more swag than I could ever have. Like so cool, yeah. but the swag was kind of repressed. And so we did end up like dating and we even ended up sleeping together a couple times. She really was extremely oh, wow. feminine and the swag was repressed and it would come out more when she was drinking. And then uh, I think as she got more comfortable with herself, she started being more swaggish yes, and yes, I had yes. to get out of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she was cool as shit. I mean, it would have been a lot, but I was like, no, no, no. What'd she do? What? Uh, she worked as a recruiter. Okay. And we're actually still friends. Okay, I was going to so, say, yeah, yeah, it sounds like you guys should be friends. We're fr- we stayed friends, and she's, like, so supportive and into comedy, and but and her girlfriend is, like, very feminine now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She did so a total much switch. swag. Total switch. Super. We were never girlfriends, good, but- that Good was, for her. Good for her. And she was young. When I met her, I thought she was 26, but she was really 22. Oh, yeah. You talked about this that is on the my one. podcast. Yep. Yeah. This is the one. Okay, so here's some lesbian first date questions. I am reading them from a reputable, 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 reputable lesbian source. Okay. Now. This is Ellen's website. The source is Ellen. So, number one, I don't think I would, I don't know how I would react to this in a day, but uh, what's your, what's the, what do you think is the best Tegan and Sarah album? Oh, shit. I, I don't know. know. I've never fucking listened, album to there. listened to them. Me neither. That's a that's a very lesbian one. Um, what did your women's march sign say? 
Oh, great question. Um, oh, really? Uh, what? I like that. Well, what if you've never been to a women's march? Emma. I would lie and say I did. Well, I've been to Mar I went to a march in, New in uh, fucking D.C. <laughs> one time. The one right after the election, the inauguration march? Eh, it was about the war, one of the war with George wow, Bush. Wow, this was a long time ago. I haven't been to a women's march. I guess I, if someone asked me that, I'd be like, Ugh. But, but, but I'd be like, good for you. No, I would like it if someone's going to marches because it shows they're interested in stuff. And yes. then I, yeah, so I would, yeah. okay, but I so you, you like I the do question. The I have the signs, yes. Okay, so you like, this, this question will be a, a point from Ashley and a, a neutral from me. So, okay. so what did your women's march sign say? I had a, um, I don't remember the exact wording, but I had like a uh, one referring to the SNL sketch about the PP tape, Trump's PP tape. Uh, yeah, it was about that. That was, that was mine. It was Good funny. Job. It was like a humorous sign. So you'll go do all the marches? I do them. Yeah, I'm so sorry. And, no, don't. <laughs> no, I good am, for I you. I am that person. No, that's Here's good. I the line. It's good. I don't, I don't drive people to the marches. Like, if mm. I'm going to D.C., I don't want to be in a car with mm. four other people like me mm. in the car. I want to mm. be by myself. Because mm. I'm a feminist, but I don't want to be listening to all that garbage while I'm driving. I just right. want to turn on a podcast and now maybe the people wouldn't be that bad maybe because i think sometimes it's like we picture it maybe they wouldn't because it's like oh god no, they, they wouldn't I, about, i'm i'm just joking but kind of serious i know what you mean okay how many of your closest friends are exes that's a good lesbian question that's a good oh. lesbian question <sighs> that's a good lesbian question because i've got two that's an i think that's a pretty healthy amount because so. if someone says they're not friends with any of their exes in the lesbian world, that'd be a little like, you're lying. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd say, I would, if someone, if they're like, I'm not friends with any of my exes, I go, really? Uh, have, how long have you been out? That's what I would want to know. Right, right, right. Because lesbians, they stay friends. We they stay, stay friends. friends. We're, st yeah. we're processing the end of the relationship for years. For years. Relationship. Yeah, I'm still friends with my, my first girlfriend from college. And, uh... I'm working some stuff out. Whether or not I'll be able to maintain a friendship with my most recent ex is um, debatable, but uh, I hope to. Get so. that good energy flowing. Where are you on the fuckboy to manic pixie dream girl spectrum? I'm way closer to fuckboy. I what think. It, I asked Love Fair, this, uh, who's a straight um, cis male comedian, and he explained fuckboys pretty well. What, what's your take on what a fuckboy is? A fuckboy is a, a guy, I think, with a lot of game who, like, a straight girl or a girl would, like, want to fix, but they're, they're just there to, they're just there to get in, get out, and then hit you up later, and maybe keep you in a cycle so that they can keep hitting you up. And that's why it's bad, because it's kind of manipulative? Yeah, it's a little manipulative. Like, a fuckboy would say some romantic shit to you and then never mm, follow through. Right, because if someone just wants to have sex with someone that's not if you're Bad. upfront about it, if you're right. upfront about it, then that's cool. Um, I try to be upfront about it, but I, I'm a little bit of a flirt. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is not good, but I think I'm also holding myself to a very high standard. Absolutely. <laughs> how long does it, how long does it take for you to introduce someone you're with to your mom and your sister? So before like no time, but Me now too. I have Me new too. rules. I have new rules now where I, I, I think you gotta be dating someone for at least three or four months and maybe closer to six is where I would put my new, my new rule. Would you introduce them to them because they're nice? And like, so it'd be like, oh, look, this is like the family. Like this gets, gets me points. Um, I don't think that my family impresses anybody. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, your sister always seems so nice. I, my sis, you know what? They are really, really nice. Yeah. And they're very accepting people and they're right. totally cool with gays and right. uh, shit like that. So yeah, actually you're right, but I, I don't use it as a tool to impress. Okay, so I would always kind of, I would like introduce people to my mom or sister quickly because I'd be like, they're fucking on, they're cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then I'd feel like it would give a better, but my mom and sister put the kibosh on that. They were, they said, no more girlfriends. That's exactly what happened. My mom said one time that it was hard for her to keep yeah. processing my breakups. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to stop doing this. <laughs> Yeah, that's, my mom was like, I accept you. And she's like, it's been too much. And yeah. I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right, you're right. 
Okay, this is the last lesbian dating question. And straight people, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna really go out on a limb here. I do not recommend the, there's not a good amount of crossover here. Don't <laughs> do these questions. People are switching the thing off right now. Yeah, even if you're a straight, if you're a straight guy, don't ask a woman these questions. And I'm gonna say, <laughs> if you're a woman, do not ask a straight man these questions, please. Especially this one. Have you at any point in your life thought you were a witch? <laughs> I really thought this was going to be like, how many people have you slept with? Right. Um, no, but I do think that most lesbians have a story. Many lesbians have a story where it's like, I was considering being a nun for a little while. I you was, were. no, 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 no. Most just, lesbians. I know oh, yeah, a yeah, lot yeah. of lesbians yep. who are like, have some weird career that no woman who likes fucking men would ever, 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 ever consider. Right. So I get this question. I feel this question. I am not that type of lesbian. I feel yes. like you too, Emma. I feel like I'm more of a mainstream type of gay. Like, yes. I'm not a big poetry, astrology. Like I love, oh, I, I do that love stuff astrology. Is fun. That stuff's fun. But I feel like I'm not like a crunchy queer. Right. Like most of my friends are straight. I'm very yes. in the straight world. I watch a lot of Bachelor, you know? Mm. So uh, I, not that I'm not, you know, in the queer community. It's just that my life doesn't revolve around the queer community the way that it does for other gay people. And there's yes. no judgment there. I just think, you know, it's what it is. Do you, so in, in your podcast, you say a few times um, that you're like, I don't want to get canceled. I'm living constant fear of getting canceled. Where is that fear coming from? Um, because I feel like <laughs> I, feel I relate, like I, say, I understand. I say dumb shit and I right. say, I say shit knowing all of the cancelable, cancelable things that, you know, what, uh, I know when I'm being problematic. Yeah. Which is a really interesting place for a comedian to be in because I think yes. it's a choice. You have to say, okay, I know that what I'm, you're, I, I don't put words in your mouth. I'll, I'll feel for me. I'll say, I, I'm asking a lot of the audience, like when I was doing those, I'm the man one, I'm the man one jokes. Yes. I felt like when I did it on Colbert and I didn't think it wasn't received well on Colbert, I was like, that was too much of an ask for a late night set where I couldn't explain myself. Because if I just go out there and say that, people on the left and the right, the left, yes. the right's like, you're gross. The left's like, you're problematic. And I yes. understood what they were. I go, I totally get why you're saying it's that's problematic. I'm hyper aware of it. thin line that razor you have to thin walk for comedy. Between razor. people who don't know anything about gender fluidity or, or pronoun. This is very new for them. They might even be hearing it for the first time yes, yes. when you're talking about it. And, maybe and then on they, the opposite side, right. people on the left who are like, you know better. And queers are so hard on other queers. Queer people can be really, really hard on queer mm -hmm. people because they know that we know better and we shouldn't say. So you're walking the line between those two audiences. And honestly, I often come down a little closer to the people who don't know because yes. that's where I can make a bigger difference. You know what Couldn't I mean? Couldn't agree Those more. Those are the people that we need to bring over and educate. And if we can do that through humor without being pretentious, that is super, super cool. And, and I hope that the queer people who are like, well, you made a joke about, um, you know, vaginas and sometimes men have vaginas. Yeah, I know sometimes men have vaginas. But I can't introduce that topic right now because I'm trying to talk to a Trump voter. Right. And get him to laugh at my jokes. Right. So, like, forgive me. Forgive right. me for the broader message that I'm trying to put out here. And the thing is, too, is it's like, I'm not saying as part of the joke, this is how it is. It's not even a point in the joke. It's a talking exactly. point to get to the thing. Exactly. And it is a, it is a tough thing to do, though. Also, the human language the reason that we have words is they're meant to encompass multiple meanings, right? right? And, and sort of have generalities as well, because if you were always trying to speak so specifically, we would never get words across. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So right. I we'd all like, be up there just like pandas or whatever. Exactly. And I think if you are a listener who feels that like maybe I just said something non-inclusive. Have you ever heard a straight comedian talk about sure. all the, all the, when men date women, sure. did you ever, would you ever go onto their Twitter and call them out and be like some men date men? Probably right. not. Because Probably you understand not. that he's speaking from his perspective. Right. So maybe, you know, we can 
instead of calling other queers out on not being totally inclusive all the time, why don't we instead elevate the queer people who do speak to those points of view and like help them out and help their podcasts and their comedy, blah, blah, blah. That is the solution to this problem, right? To get like more trans comedians and sure. more you know, women of color. There are not enough women of color in comedy, like sure. shit like that. I think too, it's like, uh, people forget when they just go into the preaching. It's like, okay, you, so you want to come at me about contextualizing everything? How do you know what you know? Could it perhaps be a class thing? Because I know for 100%, yes. 100%, no doubt in my mind, the reason I know about the intersectionality of race, class, and gender is because, I don't know, I went to a private liberal arts college, yes. and did yes. I go there because I, did, and I didn't have to take out student loans, and I wouldn't have gotten in if I had to. So yeah, yeah, yeah. do I know that for those reasons? Yeah. So yeah. if someone didn't do that, Whoa. maybe you're being classist. You think about yes. that. Yes. That is so good. That's People are so always good. falling short of that when they're like, Wait a I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I get that. But I'm going to have an understanding here because I know that that's how I know that. And when, yeah, I mean, that was, that was, that was perfect. I don't have a response. That was perfect. Oh, thanks, Ashley. Snaps thank you. or whatever the kids wow. do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So where can people find you online? But focus on TikTok. If you're on TikTok, go find Ashley on TikTok. If you search Ash Gavs, like Ashley Gavin, Ash Gavs, I'll come up everywhere. On TikTok, it's Ash Gavs Comedy, but it's Ash Gavs everywhere else. And your podcast is? We're Having Gay Sex. Thank you so much for being on the show. This was so much fun. I appreciate it.